Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokémon Soul Silver using only Rock-type Pokémon. The rules for this playthrough are in the description below. But in short, in addition to standard Nuzlocke rules, there's no using items in battle, no leveling up past the next gym leader's ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. On my quest to do a monotype Nuzlocke of every type, I've long put off the rock type. Although most rock types have phenomenal physical defense, their tiny minds are easily destroyed by any special attack. And many of them have crippling quadruple weaknesses to common types like water and grass. It makes rock types fantastic in some matchups, but literally some of the worst possible Pokémon you could bring into others. Also, there's really not that many of them, especially in earlier games. It makes doing a monotype challenge with them hard. But I'll tell you what isn't hard, taking the next step in your creative journey with this video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find thousands of classes designed to teach you creative skills, ranging from topics like illustration, graphic design, and video editing. I love having Skillshare as a sponsor because so many of their classes are perfect for teaching you the skills needed to be a content creator. When I was starting out, everything I learned about video editing with Adobe Premiere Pro was from Jordi Vanderputt's Adobe Premiere Pro for Beginners class. More recently, I've been using Natasa Nadigal's class on vocal health to help prepare my voice for long voiceover recordings, like this one, Meta. And these are just two of the thousands of classes on Skillshare, with new premium classes launched every week. The best part about Skillshare classes is that you can complete them at your own pace and however you want. There's no commitment, you can skip individual lessons if you're not interested, and because Skillshare is focused on learning, all classes are ad-free. So, if you're interested in exploring everything that Skillshare has to offer, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description below will get a one-month trial of Skillshare so that you can explore your creativity for free. Thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get into the challenge. One of the reasons why I chose Heart Gold and Soul Silver is because it is one of the few games where you can naturally catch a Rock type Pokémon before the first gym badge. Using my Chikorita, I'm able to catch a Geodude in Dark Cave. I went with Chikorita so that my rival would have Cyndaquil, because I genuinely think that the rival fight in Azalea Town would be basically impossible if he had Croconaw or Bayleaf. But anyways, this is the last you'll see of Chikorita, because now that I have Bowie, the gentle Geodude, the challenge officially begins. Let's rock and roll! Another reason I chose Heart Gold and Soul Silver for this challenge is because the first three gyms are Flying, Bug, and Normal type, all of which Rock types conveniently resist. Now, I did forget that in the remakes of Johto, Sprout Tower is mandatory, meaning that Bowie has to fight, like, 400 Bell Sprouts. Fortunately, by getting near the level cap, Bowie is able to one-shot most of the Bell Sprouts, and the ones that he doesn't aren't able to one-shot him with Vine Whip thanks to his stellar defense. So, after that, we head to Faulkner's gym with a bunch of stones we gathered, never knowing what they'll mean. Some to throw at his beautiful Jotonian birds, some to make a diamond ring. Theoretically, this fight is losable if Faulkner spams Sand Attack and I got unlucky, but he didn't spam it, so it's a super easy first gym badge. Which means I can carefully make my way to Union Cave and catch my second Rock-type encounter, an Onyx. As someone who's made an entire video about how terrible of a Pokémon Onyx is, I wasn't exactly enthusiastic about getting this guy, but his monstrous physical defense will make him moderately usable until we get a few more encounters. So, Hendrix, who also has a gentle nature, joins the band as member number two. Unsurprisingly, Bowie is able to squash Bugsy's creepy crawlies with a few rock throws. It helps that Scyther went for a Focus Energy instead of doing damage with U-Turn. So yeah, it's another straightforward battle for badge number two. I better enjoy it while it lasts. There's not really anything of note before it's time to face Whitney. Now you'd think that her two normal types wouldn't be too difficult for my two rock types to deal with, but her Clefairy has Metronome and her Miltank is a flinching fiend. Fortunately, things immediately go in my favor when Whitney's Clefairy attempts a Mimic that fails, and then Bowie hits a Magnitude 10 which has a base power of 150 and gets a clean one-shot. Her Miltank comes in next and starts doing her usual shenanigans with Stomp and Attract, but some fortuitous high rolls with Magnitude get Miltank into the yellow. Then I switch to Hendrix to shake off the Attract. Hendrix has an attack stat of 45, so he's not much of an offensive force, but he is able to nail Miltank with a Screech. Unfortunately, that's all he can do as he gets pelted by flinches from Stomp and becomes consistently immobilized by Love. So, once he's near death, I switch back to Bowie on a stomp. He then finds himself on the other end of a critical hit flinch. 
Pretty unfortunate, but the RNG balances out on the next turn as he hits another monstrous magnitude 10 and kills Miltank, winning us the third gym badge. That was way closer than I was expecting. But with three badges, I'm deemed worthy of wielding the Squirt Bottle, which I can use to enrage a pseudo Wudo on Route 36. He's my third encounter, but it is kinda scary to try to catch him because he knows a low kick. Fortunately, a single quick ball that I got from the Goldenrod Department Store Lottery does the trick. I named the quirky little guy Presley. Up next is the first major obstacle of the run, the fight against Morty. As I said in the intro, rock types have really lousy special defense, and Morty has a shadow balling Gengar, who's obviously much faster than all of my Pokemon, and is also immune to ground type moves. Fortunately, the level cap of 25 is just high enough to evolve Bowie into Graveler, and then with a quick trade, Bowie can further evolve into Golem, a pretty phenomenal Pokemon, especially this early in the game. I also make sure to EV train my three Pokemon as much as the level cap allows, so that I'll hopefully have a bit of an edge against Gengar. And the plan I've devised is relatively simple. Lead with Bowie, set up a Rock Polish against Morty's lead Ghastly so that I can outspeed his Gengar, and then try to kill him with two Rock Blasts before he kills me. The only issue is that Morty's Pokemon love to use random status moves. Oh, and Bowie's Rock type moves have shoddy accuracy, because obviously. A held wide lens does help a little bit with that last point though. As I bring out Bowie into Morty's Ghastly, he immediately uses Curse on Bowie, who I guess I accidentally forgot to heal after he took one damage from the edge training. Curse takes 25% of my HP each turn, and since Rock Blast doesn't one-shot Gengar without hitting five times, my plan has been foiled right on turn one. But I do kinda have a backup plan. I switch to Hendrix as Ghastly goes for Mean Look. Then I set up a Sandstorm to buff the special defense of all of my rock types for at least a few turns. Ghastly just goes for Spite as he takes a bit of Sandstorm chip. Then a Payback at least kills Ghastly. This gets Hendrix and Bowie to level 26 since the level cap ends at the start of the battle. Gengar is next, and thanks to the Sandstorm, Hendrix is able to survive a non-critical hit Shadow Ball and get off a Screech. But you probably see where this is going, right? In order to get a safe switch, Hendrix has to go down. As far as Onyx go, this is the most useful that one has ever been. So Godspeed, Hendrix. Godspeed. From here, I bring out Bowie, which was super, super stupid, because Gengar hits him with Hypnosis. And then, while Bowie's freaking out in a Moon Age daydream, Gengar snipes him with a nasty critical hit Shadow Ball. Had I gone to Presley instead of Bowie, which is what I do now because he's my only Pokemon left, his Chesto Berry would have prevented the Hypnosis sleep, and Faint Attack would have been a guaranteed one-shot thanks to Screech. Instead, now that Sandstorm is over, he takes a massive chunk of damage from another Shadow Ball. Fortunately, there's no crit, so Presley survives, and Gengar falls to a Faint Attack. That just leaves Morty's two Haunters, both of which can't do much to Presley, especially with his Chesto Berry intact. So Faint Attack takes them out and wins us the battle, but with Bowie and Hendrix down, there's not much reason to continue. Morty was the first major challenge, but he's certainly not the last. I can definitely play this fight better, such that, at worst, I only lose Onyx. So I decide it's time for a reset. In attempt two, I actually wind up wiping to Bugsy. Instead of using Focus Energy, his Scyther uses U-Turn, which does way too much damage to my Geodude, and then Kakuna poisons my Onyx, and it's a whole shit show. I was rushing, and I got heavily punished. In attempt three, my Geodude has a minus speed nature, and I couldn't run away from a wild Bellsprout on Route 32, so he died to a Vine Whip. That one was pretty embarrassing. But on attempt four, I managed to successfully get back to the fight against Morty. This time, all of my Pokemon are female. Golem is named Turner, Onyx is named Joplin, and Pseudowoodo is named Nyx. They also all have a plus speed nature, funny enough. This time, I decide to lead with Joplin the Onyx into Morty's stupid Ghastly. I immediately set up a Sandstorm as Ghastly goes for Spite. I'm not sure why he didn't use Curse this time, but whatever. Thanks to the chip from Sandstorm, a payback, even from Joplin's Garbo attack stat, is enough to kill the frail Ghastly. So that brings in Gengar. Joplin has a naive nature, which is minus special defense, and horrible IVs, so her special defense is even lower than its usually abysmal base 45. But with the special defense boost from Sandstorm, just maybe we survive one hit. And in truly spectacular fashion, Joplin survives with exactly 1 HP, letting her fire off a fairly hard payback. 
What an absolute queen. Also, just as a reminder, Joplin has rock head, not sturdy. And sturdy doesn't work like a focus sash until generation 5 anyways, so this was just a tremendously lucky low roll. There's an argument to be made to let Joplin go down here for a safe switch, lest Gengar gets another critical hit Shadow Ball. But how can I do that to sweet Joplin after she survived a Shadow Ball with one freaking HP? A survival that clutch is enough to make even me feel sentimental about this Onyx. So I just hard switch to Turner, who tanks a Shadow Ball moderately well with the Sandstorm. Then, after Gengar takes some more chip, he goes for a Sucker Punch for some reason, which gives me the chance to get a little lucky and kill Gengar with three hits from a Rock Blast. I was always going to need some luck to win this fight, because Gengar is just that oppressive. But now it's just the relatively useless Haunters. The first one goes for a Curse, and then our luck runs out as Turner misses a Rock Blast. Better here than against Gengar, though. Since Haunter doesn't have an attacking move that isn't Dream Eater, I stay in and get hit by Hypnosis, but a Chestoberry wakes her up. Only for her to miss a Rock Throw. I'm really missing that Wide Lens right now. Well, now I'm dead to another turn of Curse, obviously, so I switch out to Nyx, who fortunately dodges a Hypnosis. Haunter then lands a third Hypnosis, but a Chestoberry cures the sleep and lets Nyx fire off a feint attack that kills Haunter. So, last is the second Haunter. He just goes for mean look, and then a feint attack takes him out, winning us the fourth gym badge. Beating Morty without losing Joplin was completely unexpected, but it means that my three Pokemon and I can make our way towards Cyanwood City where the next major obstacle awaits. But on the way, I can fish up a Corsola from Olivine City. Technically, I could have picked up Corsola before fighting Morty, but I didn't think he'd be that helpful, and I didn't want to waste the XP I could use for EV training on the trainers that I might run into along the way. I name Corsola McCartney, and unfortunately he has the ability Hustle, which longtime viewers know that I absolutely despise. Corsola is more of a special attacker anyways, but Nature Cure would have been far more useful. This is a bit disappointing. But not as disappointing as what happens next. On my way back from Goldenrod City, where I did some shopping, I accidentally run into school kid Alan on Route 36. This little asshole has a level 17 Tangela that knows Sleep Powder, Growth, and Absorb, and that's it. Just one Pokemon. But I kid you not, Alan sweeps my entire team. I guess I used up all of my luck against Morty, because Turner misses a Rock Blast, Tangela is able to land every single Sleep Powder that he goes for, and none of my Pokemon get early wake-ups. Normally when this happens, I get pretty upset. Mostly at myself. After all, I knew what School Kid Alan had, and I made a point to avoid him since he's completely optional. But in the haste of moving between towns, I slipped up. When I wipe like this, I usually throw a little baby temper tantrum before getting back into the playthrough. But this time, I was oddly calm, and I immediately just went to restart the game and get back to the grind. Maybe this is personal growth. Or maybe I was just in pure disbelief and shock because what the actual fuck? In attempt 5, I managed to successfully get back to Morty without any issues. This time, the boys are back in town. Hendrix the Onyx, Presley the Sudowoodo, and Bowie the Golem. Against Morty, I lead with Hendrix. Also, in an attempt to get through the first part of the game as quickly as possible, I turned off battle animations and forgot to turn them back on for this fight. Anyways, Hendrix has a bit more special defense than his female counterpart from attempt 4, so barring a crit, we should be able to repeat what happened last time. But after I set up a sandstorm, Ghastly goes for Curse. So I just hard switch to Bowie, who gets hit by Mean Look. Then Ghastly tries to use Spite, which fails, and we get off a Rock Polish. Meaning that on the next turn, Bowie outspeeds and kills Ghastly with a Rock Throw. Gengar is next, but now that we outspeed, we can hit him with a Rock Blast. Bowie comes out hot and gets a crit on the first blast and lands a total of three hits, though a Citrus Berry means that Gengar survives. He just goes for a Hypnosis, which is cured by our Held Chesto Berry, though. So, a Rock Throw on the next turn takes out Gengar. The first Haunter is next, but he falls to another Rock Blast. And then the same thing happens to Morty's second Haunter, though he does get off a very weak Sucker Punch. But with that, we've gotten the easiest fourth gym badge so far. Let's try not to blow it by running into Alan again. My new Corsola is female, so I name her Nyx. Unfortunately, she still has Hustle, but oh well. By teaching Nyx Surf, we can traverse the sea and make our way to Cyanwood City. There, I can use a Rattata to smash some rocks until I find a Shuckle. I name her Turner and Turner will be an invaluable teammate going forward. Though I have a feeling that some viewers will grow to hate her shuck nanigans. You've been warned.
Anyways, this leads us to Chuck, who is an obvious issue since my rock types, other than Turner, are weak to dynamic punch. Polyrath also knows Surf and Hypnosis, and Chuck's AI is notoriously all over the place. So this is gonna be hard. He leads with Primeape and I lead with Presley. This Primeape loves to use double team, but Presley is prepared for it. As he goes for his first double team, Presley sets up a substitute. And from here, Primeape sees the kill with Focus Punch, so we're free to just hit him with Feign Attacks that never miss. It takes a while, since Feign Attack is obviously not very effective against Primeape. And Chuck heals. Which is great, because I'd rather have him heal here than when Polyrath is out, since he's the much bigger threat. Primeape does occasionally go for Leer or Rock Slide, but we're able to take him out while keeping our substitute intact. So, after Presley levels up to level 32, Polyrath comes in as Chuck's second and last Pokemon. For whatever reason, he goes for Body Slam first, which unfortunately ends up breaking our adorable substitute. But it means we're able to get off a moderately strong low kick for free. On the next turn, Polyrath misses a Hypnosis, meaning that we're able to get off another low kick that activates his Citrus Berry. Then, Polyrath goes for a Focus Punch, which lets Presley hit yet another low kick. Next, Chuck goes for Body Slam, which is just as random as it was the first time, but without the sub, we obviously get paralyzed. Another low kick leaves Polyrath in the red. So on the next turn, Chuck heals as we go for yet another kick to the groin. A substitute probably would have been better there, because now we're risking a full paralysis every time Polyrath goes for Focus Punch. I decide to risk it for at least one turn, but Polyrath just goes for Surf. Thanks to a Pasho Berry that my mom gave me though, we easily tank the hit, letting us get off one last low kick. But now Presley is dead to Surf, and also Focus Punch. So I switch out to Turner, who gets hit by a Focus Punch, which does pretty good damage. Then, thanks to some special defense EVs, he easily tanks a Surf and gets off a Wrap, which doesn't do much damage, but at least does residual chip for a few turns. This means that Turner can rest on the next turn to get back to full HP as a Chesto Berry wakes her up, though we do have to tank a hard Focus Punch. But Wrap is slowly working its magic. On the next turn, we tank a Surf and nail Polyrath with a Flash to lower his accuracy. And here's where I might lose some people. Basically, Turner's entire deal for the rest of this playthrough will be to stall enemies out of PP. She can do this with a combination of Flash to lower accuracy, Rest for recovery, and in certain situations, Protect an Encore. She doesn't even necessarily need to deal damage herself in most instances. This isn't exactly the most noble way to win battles, and it does require at least some luck in most instances, but given my available encounters, there are many matchups going forward where I really don't see any other reliable path to victory without a stupid amount of luck. That's the downside of monotype challenges though. Sometimes you gotta use cheap strategies. Watching Turner execute excruciatingly long stalls isn't the most thrilling type of battles though, so unless I see a reason not to, I'll be skipping Turner's shuck nanigans with a bit of editing magic. Against Chuck's Polyrath, I try to go the route of taking him out with Rap instead of flashing him down and stalling out PP. Sadly though, Turner falls just short of taking him out. Not knowing whether Polyrath will go for Surf or Focus Punch here, I decide that the best thing to do is bring in Hendrix, who will probably die to either Focus Punch or Surf, but he is our most sackable teammate. However, thanks to the single flash that Turner was able to get off, Polyrath actually misses Focus Punch, marking the second time in the challenge that an Onyx has narrowly avoided death. With a payback to take out Polyrath's last sliver of health, we've won yet another unexpectedly deathless gym badge. Jokes are always better when you make them twice. The next few badges are in pretty quick succession. After healing Amphi so that she can continue her endless servitude in the Olivine Lighthouse, I make my way to Price. He's technically the seventh gym leader, but his level cap is lower than Jasmine's, so I want to take care of him first. He leads with a seal, who I always forget isn't actually ice type. And now it's Nyx's time to shine. We start with an Ancient Power that doesn't even do half damage as Seal sets up a Hail. After some chip damage, another Ancient Power leaves Seal with a Sliver, but then he just goes for Rest. I don't want to waste all of my Ancient Power PP on this Seal, so I switch to Shadow Ball. Seal is able to snore in his sleep for a little bit of damage, but it's not much of an issue. A second Shadow Ball puts Seal in range to a Hyper Potion, which lets Nyx get off a Recover. Then it's a few more Shadow Balls. Seal does hit an Icy Wind so that he outspeeds my piece of pink coral, meaning that he can get off a rest on the next turn, but thanks to a special defense drop from Shadow Ball, Seal goes down before he wakes up. This brings in Pyloswine. He sets up a Hail, which activates his Snow Cloak ability and causes our Surf to miss. That's pretty annoying. 
because he then goes on the offensive with a mud bomb that probably would have killed after Hail Chip if it crit. But since it didn't, Nick survives and fortunately connects with the Surf, though that's not quite enough for the kill, letting Piloswine get back into the yellow with a Citrus Berry. Since this jerk has upped evasion and perfect blizzards, my only play here is to bring in Turner and heck him up. With some shuck nanigans, we can stall out blizzards 5 PP. Fortunately, I had the foresight to give Turner an Asper Berry because one of the blizzards does end up freezing. But with even more shuck nanigans, I eventually manage to land an Encore on Piloswine on a turn that he uses Hail. This lets me safely switch to Nyx, recover back to nearly full HP, and then take Piloswine out with a Surf. Last is Dugon, but he can't do anything to Nyx. After hitting Dugon with one Ancient Power, Price tells me that his middle name is Willow. Didn't ask, but okay, dude. One more Ancient Power takes out Dugon, defeating Price Willow and winning us the sixth gym badge. From here, I can backtrack to Olivine City and quickly take care of Jasmine for badge number seven. Her lead Magnemity is easily outsped and killed twice over by an Earthquake from Bowie. Steelix comes in second, so I switch to Nyx, who would have barely survived even a critical hit from Iron Tail. Then we outspeed and kill Steelix with a single surf. So all that's left is Jasmine's second Magnemite. It's a safe switch back to Bowie on a Thunderbolt, and then one Earthquake seals the deal, netting us the easiest gym badge since Bugsy. The final gym leader is Claire, who with her Kingdra is definitely the scariest Johto gym leader in most Johto playthroughs, let alone one where almost all of my encounters are weak to water type moves. But before that, I do get a chance at a few more encounters. In the Safari Zone, I take a crack at catching Larvitar from the mountain area. It'd be cool to catch him here, because otherwise I won't be able to get one until I have access to Mount Silver at the very end of the game. Rather unsurprisingly, Larvitar does flee before I catch him, though. It's a bit of a bummer that so many Pokemon in HeartGold and SoulSilver are locked in the Safari Zone. I've thought about making a Safari Zone exception to the whole only catch the first encounter per area rule of Nuzlocking to allow for fleeing and or allowing encounters in different areas of the Safari Zone because it would allow for a larger, more diverse list of encounters in some of these challenges. But at least for the current challenge, I decide that my time in the Safari Zone is up. Let me know in the comments what you think about some sort of Safari Zone clause though. Anyways, from here I head back to Violet City and pick up the Slugma Egg from Primo by entering in some phrases that sound like code words to awaken sleeper agents. Slugma isn't a rock type, but with the new level cap, I can immediately evolve Bono into Macargo, who finally gives my team somewhat of an answer into grass types. So guess what Bono's very first mission is? Each, Alan. Each. Anyways, after some largely forgettable rocket stuff, it's time to take on Claire. As I said before, her Kingdra is incredibly dangerous. Never mind the fact that she has Sniper, Hydro Pump literally just one-shots all of my Pokemon, other than maybe Nyx who can clap back with an Ice Beam or something for like 30% damage. I mean, even before Claire, a random Seedra that one of her gym trainers has gets one critical hit away from sweeping my entire team. Water types are, by far, the hardest thing for my team to deal with. So this is going to be difficult. Well, actually, I guess it depends on what you mean by difficult. The only way I can figure out how to beat Claire is to combine, like, three of the cheapest strategies in the game. Stall, Substitute, and Setup. Claire leads with a Gyarados who doesn't know any Water-type moves, so it's fairly easy to wear her down with Shuck Nanigans until she's been effectively completely nullified. This grants me a safe switch to Bowie as Gyarados misses a Twister. On the next turn, Gyarados connects with a Twister, and Bowie uses Substitute. So then, Gyarados lands another weak twister, which doesn't break my sub, letting Bowie get off a safe rock polish. He now outspeeds and can hit Gyarados with a strength. Gyarados just misses a few attacks as Bowie slowly beats him down with strengths. As usual, we get Claire to waste her Hyper Potion here, before Gyarados falls with Bowie's substitute well intact. This brings in Kingdra. Thanks to the rock polish, we now outspeed and can hit her with an Earthquake. But it's not nearly enough for a one-shot, Hence the substitute, which prevents Bowie from being murdered by a Hydro Pump. This lets him fire off a second Earthquake that seems to just barely take out Kingdra. Crisis averted. All that's left are Claire's two Dragonairs. A lot of these Johto gym leaders love having two of the same unevolved Pokemon, huh? Regardless, Earthquakes from Bowie take both of them out with a single shot apiece, winning us the eighth and final gym badge. With that, we've almost made it to the Elite Four. We do have to fight the Kimono Girls, all of whom can be taken care of without much thought, other than the last one, Kimono Girl Kuni, who has a Vaporeon. 
where Slippy Dog hits so hard with Surf, even into Nyx, who's barely doing any damage in return. If Vaporeon gets a single critical hit here, I'm in a lot of trouble. Fortunately, it ends up working out. But given that we're in the late game now, it would have been safer to sacrifice Hendrix to get off a Sandstorm. Even with abusing stall strats and substitute, this challenge has required a lot of luck. But anyways, now I have to go face off against Lugia. Instead of just running away, I decide to catch him with my Master Ball. Nyx can't learn Waterfall, so Lugia will be my group EHM user for the rest of the run. Then, we can head to Victory Road, and I can catch my final encounter before the Elite Four, a Rhyhorn. I name her Joplin. Her calm nature isn't exactly ideal, and she serves the same basic purpose as Bowie once she evolves into Rhydon, but I figure that she's certainly more useful than Hendrix. So here's my final Elite Four team, leveled up to level 47 to match Karen's Houndoom. Let's see if these rock stars have what it takes to be victorious. First up is Will. He leads with his first Zatu, and I lead with Bowie. Thanks to a Choice Scarf, we're able to just barely outspeed and kill Zatu with three hits from Rock Blast. So far, so good. That brings in Slowbro, so I switch to the only Pokemon I have that can moderately tank a Water-type attack. And thank goodness I do, because Slowbro crits with a Water Pulse. So I go for a Recover as Slowbro goes for a Curse. Then I start firing off super effective Shadow Balls, as Will makes this easy for me and just keeps going for Curse. Two Shadow Balls is all it takes to bring down Slowbro. Third is Jinx. She goes for a hard Psychic, and then Nyx retaliates with a much harder Power Gem. Then Jinx goes for a Lovely Kiss, which activates our health Chesto Berry, letting us get the knockout with another Power Gem. Fourth is Exeggutor, who thankfully doesn't know a Grass-type attacking move. I switch to Bono as Eggy goes for Reflect. Then she uses Psychic, which crits. But Bono survives to hit a critical hit of his own, taking out Eggy with a Flamethrower. So last is Will's second Zatu. I switch to Bowie on a pretty hard Psychic but it looks like he'll survive even a critical hit Psychic, so I stay in. And then Bowie shows that he didn't come to the Elite Four to mess around. He connects with five hits of Rock Blast to take out Zatu in one shot through Reflect, even after her Citrus Berry activates. An absolute legend. Keep it up, that's Will defeated. Next up is Koga, but he's the Elite Four member I'm least worried about. Rock types resist poison. He also leads with an Ariados that just gets eviscerated by a soft sand boosted earthquake from Bowie before he can even do anything. That brings in Fortress. So I switch to Bono as Fortress attempts a protect. Then he sets up a layer of toxic spikes before we roast him alive with another flamethrower. Third is Venomoth, so after he hits a pretty soft psychic, we roast him alive as well. Fourth is Muck, so I switch to Bowie, who does get poisoned by the toxic spikes as Muck goes for a minimize. But like I said, Bowie didn't come to mess around. On the next turn, he connects with an Earthquake for the one-shot. Muck is essentially completely walled by Turner, but that clutch Earthquake hit just saved me like 20 minutes of shucknanigans. Last is Crobat, so I stay in as he uses Double Team. Unfortunately, Bowie gets his first miss of the night and takes some more poison damage. But on the next turn, after Crobat goes for Double Team again, Bowie manages to connect, though it's only two hits. That's okay, Bowie. Get all of the bad RNG out of the way now. I switch to Joplin next, who's holding a Petcha Berry to heal the poison from Toxic Spikes on the switch. So she just has to shrug off a weak wing attack. Then Crobat goes for yet another double team, so Joplin misses her very first attack. But after tanking another wing attack, her second Rock Blast connects, and Crobat goes down to two hits, winning us the battle. Third for the Elite Four is Bruno, who much like Chuck is quite the problem. It's really just his Machamp, who thanks to No Guard can't be cheesed by Flash from Turner. I also, for the life of me, could not get my mom to buy me any Chopple Berries, which would have been very useful for this fight. Fortunately, we can do something very similar to what we did against Claire. Bruno's lead is Hitmontop, who basically always goes for Dig or Counter. By teaching Bowie Protect, Substitute, and Rock Polish, we're able to get Bowie into a situation where he's behind a Substitute and able to outspeed the rest of Bruno's team. The only issue now is that Earthquake is a roll to kill Hitmontop, and he just keeps spamming Counter so I do have to stall Hitmontop out of counter PP before going on the offensive. It of course ends up being a complete waste of time, because once Hitmontop runs out of counter PP, we just crit with Earthquake, but whatever. The KO on Hitmontop levels up Bowie to level 49, where he learns Stone Edge. This is actually pretty awesome, because I had to get rid of Rock Blast after Koga to teach Bowie Protect by TM. I didn't actually know that Bowie would learn Stone Edge here, but that will help out a ton against Lance. Nice. From here, it's just an Earthquake Sweep. 
Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan both have weak physical defense, which honestly doesn't make much sense, but whatever. They both go down to a single earthquake apiece. Machamp is third and bulky enough to survive an earthquake, which is why we needed the substitute. It lets Bowie survive the cross chop and kill Machamp with another earthquake. And then last is Bruno's Onyx, but I have no sympathy for him as we just murder him with a final earthquake, winning us the battle. That just leaves Karen for the Elite Four. She leads with her Umbreon, and I stick to my big guns, my main man Bowie. Umbreon gets off a double team as Bowie goes for a rock polish. Then I set up a substitute in case Umbreon tries to go for Confuse Ray, but the Night Doggo just goes for double team. Not that Bowie really gives a single sh**, because on the next turn an Earthquake connects and brings Umbreon into the yellow as he just does the only thing that Johto and Kanto AI know how to do. We do miss a second Earthquake here, so I take a soft feint attack. But Bowie was just catching his breath, because a third Earthquake connects and kills Umbreon. Second is Vileplume. Thankfully we have a substitute up, because it means that we can just stay in and kill Vileplume with two Earthquakes. Bono the Macargo actually would have died from a critical hit pedal dance, so once again, substitute with Bowie was the safest play here. Third is Gengar, so I go for a substitute. She then misses a Focus Blast, making this way easier than I was expecting it to be. But that's what you get for using an inaccurate move, Karen. Anyways, one more Stone Edge is enough to kill Gengar. So fourth is Houndoom, but we easily take her out with yet another Earthquake. This is going swell. Last is Murkrow, who is powerless into my entire team. I can obviously kill her with Bowie, but I decide to switch to Turner so that she'll get the level up before Lance. Murkrow just uses Whirlwind, which brings Bowie back out. So I switch to Presley, who shrugs off a Fain attack. Then Murkrow actually hits a pretty hard critical hit Fain attack, but Presley retaliates with a Zoom Lens boosted Rock Slide for the one shot. That's Karen and the Elite Four defeated. So now it's time for the fight against Lance. You'd think his flying type Pokemon wouldn't be that big of an issue, but you'd be wrong. They're all super strong and pretty fast. He also leads with a Gyarados with Waterfall, so right off the bat, that's a huge issue. Fortunately, it's nothing a bit of shuck nanigans can't handle. I mean, that's not even really true. Like, if Gyarados flinches with Waterfall on turn one, I'm so screwed. Fortunately, he doesn't, so Turner gets off a sunny day. She was also holding a Pasho Berry to deal with that first Waterfall. From here, it's classic shucknanigans. Flash to lower Gyarados' accuracy, rest to recover HP, and protect to stall PP when necessary. It's not completely foolproof, because potential flinch crits, even in the sun, could be really bad. But it ends up working out. After Gyarados is completely out of his 15 waterfall PP, it's off to Bono. He does have to tank a super weak Dragon Pulse, but this lets us get off a yawn. Then we tank another Dragon Pulse and get off a Recover to get back to full HP as Gyarados falls asleep. This grants me a safe switch to Bowie on Gyarados' first turn of sleep. On his second turn, I set up a Substitute. And then on his third turn, I misclick. Gyarados stays asleep and we kill him with a Stone Edge, but I absolutely meant to set up a Rock Polish there. Because now, Bowie does not outspeed Lance's Dragonites. That was super stupid. But look. Shuck Nanigans really takes it out of you mentally. The first Dragonite comes in and I go for a Protect to potentially stall out Blizzard PP in the case that we miss an attack. But then we actually get lucky and Dragonite misses a Blizzard, so we kill him with a Stone Edge and our substitute remains intact. The biggest of Lance's Dragonites comes in next. I again go for a Protect, which ends up being heavily punished as Lance just uses Safeguard. That was also super stupid. Dragonite then breaks Bowie's substitute with an Outrage before we miraculously connect with our third Stone Edge in a row. But somehow, that does not one-shot Dragonite. That's absolutely insane to me. 100 base power, stab, and super effective, as Dragonite is a tank. Bowie's just got one more Stone Edge PP left here, but sadly, he'll never get to use it. Because Dragonite lands a critical hit Outrage, finally taking out Bowie, my precious. That's a really rough crit, but ultimately it's completely my fault. Somehow, I managed to mess up substitute setup strats, and I rightfully got heavily, heavily punished. Rest in peace, my beautiful beast. Thank you for an all-star, hall of fame worthy performance. You will be missed. Joplin is able to come in and kinda survive a non-critical hit outrage before retaliating with a zoom lens boosted stone edge. Next is Lance's third Dragonite, who misses a Dragon Rush like a loser, and then goes down to another Stone Edge. Fifth is Charizard, so it's off to Nyx on a Soft Air Slash. 
Then she tanks a Dragon Claw and retaliates with a Surf that crits for the one-shot. Amazing. So last for Lance is his Aerodactyl. I switch to Joplin on a Thunderfang. Then she tanks a Crunch before firing back with a Stone Edge that knocks out Aerodactyl, winning us the fight against Lance. That means that we've become champions and made it to the Hall of Fame, but it's not over quite yet. At the onset of this challenge, I decided that I would take this run all the way through Kanto and challenge the Ultimate Trainer Red on top of Mount Silver. In the past, I've done separate videos for Johto and Kanto, but upon playing through the Kanto postgame in this challenge, I just found it so profoundly boring that I don't think it would make for a great video on its own. I love the idea of the Kanto postgame in theory, but in practice, it's excruciatingly tedious, the level caps are all over the place, and only a handful of gym leaders are even remotely difficult, and even then, it's almost always because they just spam status and evasion moves. Yes, I understand the irony of me complaining about this when I just heavily abused a shuckle with flash. Nevertheless, I think it's better to just go through Kanto briefly here. Now, the cool thing about the Kanto postgame is that I can actually get a few more encounters, all of which will be on my final team for red. First, on Route 12, by waiting for a swarm, I can fish up a relicanth. I name him Dylan. Then I can head to the Pewter City Museum and revive a fossil. It'd be nice to be able to revive multiple fossils, but Nuzlocke rules technically only allow one encounter per route. I've gone back and forth on making an exception to this in Monotypes as well, since the encounter list is already so limited. Again, let me know what you think about that in the comments. For now though, I choose to revive just one fossil, the Root Fossil, which I got from Cliff Cave back in Johto. Much more so than Nyx, Cooper will be very helpful into the remaining water types in the game. From here, it's more or less a boss battle gauntlet against the eight Kanto gym leaders. Like I said, the level caps are kind of all over the place, so I just use a single level cap of 60 for all of them to match Blue's Ace Pidgeot. But in general, I don't really over level, I just kind of bang out each gym leader at whatever level I happen to get to them at. Even Blue is pretty easy. With Bowie no longer on the team, Joplin has stepped up as our primary physical attacker. I was able to pick up the TM for Rock Polish on Route 10, and unlike Bowie, she can learn Swords Dance. So, after using Shucknanigans to stall out Exeggutor's 15 PP across his two attacking moves, Joplin is able to easily set up and sweep through Blue's team. And thank goodness she can, because his team is actually pretty terrifying into our Rock types if we weren't using Setup. Another Gyarados and another Machamp is definitely not what you want to see. But it all works out, so let's move on. With all 16 gym badges acquired, Professor Oak finally deems me strong enough to head to Mount Silver and train against wild Pokemon that are in the mid to high 40s. Once I'm there, I can finally catch a Larvitar who I name Prince. And with some rapid growth, Prince evolves all the way into a Tyranitar. Better late than never, I guess. Professor Oak also gave me the HM for Rock Climb, meaning that I can head into Mount Mortar and pick up a Protector. This lets me evolve Joplin into Rhyperior, so that I have a bit of added bulk and power for the final fight of the run. So, here's the final team that I'll be using to take on Red, leveled up to the level cap of 84 to match his Venusaur, Blastoise, and Charizard. I didn't exactly plan for this, but these six Pokémon are also the most recent additions to the team. Bowie, rest his soul, Hendrix, Presley, and Nyx all deserve a rest. So let's do this. My battle against Red begins as he sends out his level 88 Pikachu. I lead with Prince, who immediately sets up a permanent Sandstorm thanks to his Sandstream ability. With a Choice Scarf, he also outspeeds Pikachu and easily one-shots him with an Earthquake. One down, five to go. Blastoise is next, so I switch to Cooper as he connects with a Focus Blast, but the special defense boost from the Sandstorm means that it doesn't do much. I've also gotten a Leftovers during my time in Kanto, so we're able to recover a bit of HP here. Blastoise then fires off a very hard Blizzard. Cooper tanks it well enough and retaliates with an Energy Ball that brings Blastoise into the yellow. After some Sandstorm Chip and Leftovers recovery, Cooper tanks one more Blizzard and then finishes off Blastoise with a second Energy Ball. Third is Lepra, who also has Blizzard. I go for a Protect to gain a bit of HP back from Leftovers, and to let the Sandstorm slowly chip away at Red's Leviathan. Then I switch to Dylan, who shrugs off a Brine. I guess Red predicted the switch. On the next turn, a Head Smash from Dylan, who's holding a Wide Lens, cleanly one-shots Lepra. And thanks to his ability Rock Head, he doesn't even take recoil damage. Fourth is Venusaur, so it's off to Bono. 
With the Sandstorm boost, he easily shrugs off the Giga Drain. Venusaur then tries to get cheeky with a Sleep Powder, but I came prepared. A Chesto Berry means that Bono is freely able to fire off a Flamethrower, which doesn't quite kill Venusaur. And after Sandstorm Chip, Red uses a Full Restore, but he gets heavily punished for it because a second Flamethrower crits and one-shots Venusaur. This is by far the hardest working Macargo I've ever seen. Next up is Red's Charizard, who Bono just laughs in the face of. He brushes off a Dragon Pulse, and then snipes the overexposed Lizard right out of the sky with a single Ancient Power. That leaves Red with only his Snorlax. Bono shrugs off a Crunch, which drops his defense stat, but then he gets off a Yawn. So I switch to Joplin as Snorlax goes for another weak Crunch and then falls asleep. Then I hit Snorlax with a massive Rock Wrecker that literally takes a full 10 seconds to bring Snorlax into the red. Why don't we take this time to just breathe and be alone with our thoughts? That was relaxing, wasn't it? Anyways, Snorlax takes his first turn of sleep, and then rather anticlimactically, the Sandstorm Chip finishes him off, winning us the battle and the run. That one was a lot of fun. It's been a while since I've done a challenge that has required more than one or two attempts, which every now and then is a pretty refreshing experience. This run also let me use a lot of Pokemon I don't normally use, and even though he fell off hard after the fourth gym, I gained ever so slightly more respect for Onix in the early game. There's just three types left until I've done at least one video of every type, so look out for those before the end of the year. Though, as I've always done, I'll be sure to mix in other challenges as well to keep things fresh. Oh, and let me know what you think about the new layout. I know people have expressed interest in a darker background, and I think the outline makes everything look much more polished, which was well overdue. Anyways, if you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my Highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. Right now, I'm nuzlocking another ROM hack, Inclement Emerald, and having an absolute blast. Also, be sure to join the Flagon HG community Discord where you can discuss nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.